Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary, and we are continuing in our series on world religions, and our subject today is Jainism which is a variation that comes out of Hinduism, so we're going to be discussing a little bit about both. And my guest, well, you're probably wondering, where is my guest? Uh, He's not with us at the table, but we are going to be interviewing him off camera for uh, security reasons, and we're not even going to give you his name. We're going to give you a pseudonym. So, Conrad, welcome, and we appreciate your being a part of the table with us today. Thank you, Dr. Bach, for the introduction. I look forward to the conversation. Very good. Now, um, let's talk about your own interest in how you became familiar with uh, Hinduism in general and Jainism in particular, because Jainism is probably one of the least well-known of the religions that we're going to discuss in this series, coming from northern India, uh, involving many people there, or primarily from northern India, involving many people there, but also now has managed to come into the United States. Most people are not aware that there are at least a thousand families, for example, in the LA area and estimates put it at about uh, 50,000 or so in North America. So so how did you become familiar with, with these uh, religions? So God burdened me and my wife for unreached people who have never heard the gospel. And in our desire and intentionality at following his call and his heart into working with unreached people, he led us to India. And India, let's see, 1.2, 1.3 billion people who have never heard the gospel before. And getting involved into India, yeah, meeting people, um, living life, understanding who's there. Um, you know, you've got 100, 200 million Muslims, majority of the people in India are Hindu, you've got Buddhists. And um, we learned that 4% of the population of India is represented by people who consider themselves, consider themselves as Jain. Mm-hmm. So 4% of India, 4% of 1.2 billion people are Jain. And last night I actually Googled, there's a Darasar, which is a Jain temple right here in Dallas. Mm. And uh, I don't know how many Jains would be here in Dallas, but Jains are one of the most unreached peoples on the face of the planet. There are only a few handfuls of Jain people who have come to faith from a Jain background in the world that I know about. Mm -hmm. And so most people, in terms of mission, there's not much work going on with Jains. Okay. So it's uh, – I I was trying to do the math real quick on what 4% of uh, 1.2 million people would be. Uh, 10% would be 120 million. So 4% would be about um, 50 million probably or thereabouts. It's a, that's a significant number. So if you meet someone from South Asia, uh, two of the most common surnames, um, Jane surnames, are Shah mm-hmm. and Meta, hmm. and even Jane. So if you, if you know a Shah or someone that has the last name Meta, uh, chances are that they are they are Jane for sure. And Meta, is that M-E-H-T-A? That's right. Okay. Shah is a common Common Indian name, yep. so it's not unusual. Um, okay, well, that's that in itself is interesting. Um, so, and where did you? Uh, well, uh, what region of India did you minister in? Okay, we were in Western India, uh-huh. in the state of Gujarat, uh-huh. and we lived in the city of Ahmedabad. Mm-hmm. The heartbeat of Jain country is found in Gujarat Mm -hmm. and the southern part of Rajasthan. So the two most holy sites of Jainism Mm -hmm. are probably within a six to seven hour drive from Ahmedabad. The most holy site of Jainism is in a place called Palitana. Uh And um, they, um, they believe that's where Mahavir had his enlightenment, more or less. And so it's this mountain that you climb up. There are like 3,000 stairs you climb up, and there are over 1,000 temples on the top of the mountain. Mm-hmm. And a lot of Jain pilgrims go there to uh, rid their karma and to um, 
So it's a fascinating place. So if you're ever in West India, make your way to a place called Politana, and you'll be blown away. Okay. Now, um, so am I right that there was a migration involved with with Jains, or, or is the has it always been centered in Western India? So Jains, um, can I answer you the question long way around? Yeah. Now, um, when I said Jains represent four percent of the population of India. <laughs> They own 20% of the wealth. Okay. And so why is that important? Um, in, in order to understand Jainism and their migration patterns, you have to understand their lifestyle and why they live the way they do. And so Jains um, will never be farmers. They won't do anything that will involve um, the earth. So Jains believe in this, uh, this philosophy known as Ahimsa, which mm -hmm. translates nonviolence. Yes. And so a Jain, historically, for millennia, for you know, a long, long time, they would even be afraid to walk across a farm field or dig anything up. They don't have anything to do with nonviolence includes anything having to do with death, right? That's right. Okay. So they won't eat, they're, they're strict vegetarians, so uh -huh. they will not eat root vegetables. Right. So no carrots, no garlic, no leeks, no onions, no potatoes. Mm -hmm. And so because... Vegans of, on steroids. Vegans on steroids, for <laughs> yeah. sure, right? And yeah. so because of these beliefs they had to find modes of work that mm -hmm. would allow them to protect and stick true to their convictions and so what what job will allow them to do that uh, pushing numbers so most accountants in india it, almost all the accountants i know in india are jain in, in gujarat mm. so my I, I had a team of accountants that were all jain mm. so pushing numbers they're really good with math they're really good with business they own companies and uh, you know so they might let's say own a farm but they're not going to work on the farm mm -hmm. right so they're going to make tons of money and because they're enterprising because they're entrepreneurial they can go anywhere in the world hmm. and um like i said 20 percent of the wealth of india is owned by jane so my my accountant um was he, he comes from a very wealthy family so think of 1960 1970s india his family owned 70 vehicles hmm. in, in India, right? Hmm. So some of the wealthiest guys in India, you think of like Adani, um, who's one of Modi's trusted advisors. He's a big time business guy all around the world, billionaire. A lot of the billionaires and multimillionaires are, are all Jane. Hmm. And and you said that explains the migration pattern, so... That would be my guess. I, okay. I, you know, I, I, yeah, I've never heard that before, but okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so so let's let's back up. Um, um, uh, Jainism comes out of, of Hinduism, so uh, we haven't we haven't talked much about Hinduism in the series yet. So let's let's talk about Hinduism a little bit and the relationship between it and Jainism. Okay, so Hinduism is this extant. Well, you first have to ask yourself, what is Hinduism? Mm -hmm. Is it a religion or is it a civilization? Mm -hmm. Because in, in reality, there are basically, in, what I like to say, a million Hinduisms. Yeah, sure. And so, in, in light of that, um, there were a lot of reform movements that came from Hinduism. Buddhism, Buddhism was one, and Jainism was another one. So Mahavir was a Hindu, and there were several things he wasn't happy with. Corruption in, in the Hindu temples was one of them. Um, but Hinduism and Jainism share a lot of the same concept, uh, concepts. Um, like, uh, like the Ahinsa, the, the vegetarianism, um, Jains will worship different Tirthankars. So a Tirthankar is basically like, so Mahavir would be considered the last Tirthankar or the first, I, I mix this up. Mm -hmm. So when you go to Palitana, for instance, as you're climbing the mountain, there are different places and stages where you worship different Jain religious gurus of, of the past. And a Jain, just to explain, is someone who has achieved this kind of, for lack of a better description, super spirituality that is the goal of Jainism? You, you, would, you would be born into a Jain family. That's how you become a Jain. Okay. And um, I know of one Hindu guy who was Hindu, and they paid a pujari, a priest, to do a certain kind of puja to become a Jain. So, okay. so there are ways to pay money to kind of change your caste or your religion in India, in, in like the Hindu worldview. But basically, the, um, yeah, so, uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? At the, top of the, at the top of the Jain chain, if I can say it that okay. way, are these people who have become um, 
pure, spiritually pure, if I can say it that way. They're at the top of the. So the people that you're worshiping as you move up this this um, this ladder on the mountain. Uh, these are, I take it, these are people who have achieved Nirvana, a, a certain level of spirituality. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and so like they believe Mahavir attained right. moksha. Right. And so moksha, this idea of release from the cycle of samsara of rebirth and redeath. Right. And karma and ka- so you know, it, 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 uh, Hindus will call it um, neurode grantis, uh-huh. knots of the heart. Uh-huh. So for mo- for a lot of Hindus, there are three problems, and in, in some ways, this would apply to chains. So you have avidya, kama, and karma. So avidya translates as ignorance, and so it's like you are ignorant to the fact that you are God, God is in you, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the ignorance is driven by kama, which is like a, a desire. So you know you have you have these desires that are produced by ignorance, which lead to you having to do certain acts and deeds to kind of quench this uh, understanding for. The, the true knowledge um, and the truth that you are God and God is in you. And then it, it, it's all melded together and, and different Jains believe different things. And so there are two main sects of Jainism, mm-hmm. uh, the Degambras, mm-hmm. and it's slipping my mind right now, um, the other one, but the, the Degambras are, you'll hear sometimes of um, these Jain priests that will walk around naked in India. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like this idea of wearing clothes um, could harm an insect or an animal. That's why they don't wear clothes hmm. because the the idea of ahimsa is so important to them. Mm-hmm. And so, if like you, I would go into Jain temples in our city, and the priests they would wear these masks over their mouth and their nose for fear of inhaling um, a bug or a fly or a mosquito, that kind of thing. And so, they really go to the extreme of 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 looking out for life, even to the fact like a lot of my Jain friends in India, they would not eat dinner after sunset mm-hmm. because they when it goes dark they, they want to make sure they can see what they're putting in their mouth hmm. and so they're they're very devoted they're very and, and granted keep in mind there are exceptions like there are you know there are Jains who would be secret non-vegetarians mm-hmm. and i had plenty of those mm-hmm. and um but generally speaking Jains are pretty strict and austere people the second group that you're talking about i think now i may not, i may botch this pronunciation but it looks like it's cheve tambara okay that, uh, that, yeah. uh so um Anyway, so so we've got these different groups. It's it's a form of well, let's 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 stay on Hinduism for a second. Uh, Hinduism is so different from Christianity that I think we just need to stop and realize how different it is. There's no let, let's start at the basics when we think about this theologically there's no creator god correct there there's a, they call it the trimurti mm-hmm. and so the three main gods in hinduism now keep in mind in the hindu pantheon there are 330 million gods and goddesses uh-huh. and that's according to diana Eck out of the ecumenical center at harvard university and okay. i don't know how she came up with that number <laughs> and i, don't know how I hope she it. didn't miss one along the way <laughs> so, but but the uh, hindus will, will talk about the trimurti so uh, brahma shiva and vishnu mm-hmm. so like shiva is the lord of destruction the god of the demons vishnu is the preserver so like the various das avatara the, the various incarnations mm-hmm. so when when, uh, when when the world is in danger um and the gods need to save it vishnu will send his avatar to kind of save the world and then brahman is kind of like the they might say he's the creator god but in the sense that we understand it it would be totally different yeah not like we understand it be okay because my next question was going to be what about the creation is it created or is it does it as it always existed there, there are different myths and understandings you know whether like you know from a grain of rice to uh, yeah so i mean there, there, there's uh, where the creation comes from um but there's it's actually not a question they're very concerned with. Is that no, true? No, yeah, no, yeah. No, yeah. So no. I, I'm I'm just trying to point out here and pick out how um, how this is really significantly different than anything we think about in the West. So so when you think about so there, there's a Hindu concept known as Atman, mm-hmm. right? And so it's this 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 universal consciousness that is in you and it's in me and it's the god soul mm-hmm. that exists and that's what's always existed right from time begin before time began or whatever and so all of this some hindus believe all of this that we experience in life is an illusion right and so 
you're, you're living life and you have this fatalistic view of what will be will be and it's all based on you know whatever there's so many different schools of hinduism but like if, if you're you know you're living your life and you're you're trying to follow your dharma and your caste and you know there's certain things that um you're supposed to do and you're not supposed to do and it, it improves your karma or takes away your karma and that will determine your next birth and so it's this endless cycle of rebirth and redeath and mm -hmm. you're trying to escape from that right you're trying to uh, you know so it, yeah, it's, it's a never-ending mess. Okay, well, um, so l l again, I'm going to help have you define terms here. So Dharma is... So <laughs> when you talk to a Hindu, um, a Hindu will never refer, if they're talking in their main language, if they're talking in Hindi, mm -hmm. they will never refer to their belief system as a religion. Mm -hmm. uh, they, Hindus call their, their belief system Sanatana Dharma. So basically, um, Dharma, transla it, it's an all-encompassing concept of truth, righteousness, law, fate, order. It, it's this idea of how everything fits together. And so Sanatana Dharma it, it basically translates the eternal faith. Hmm. So when a Hindu thinks about Christianity, they refer to it as Videshi Dharma. Hmm. So the, this concept of Dharma is foundational. If you really want to understand Hinduism, you've got to understand the idea of Dharma. And so the swast, uh, which we get the word swastika, hmm. like what, it's a Hindu symbol. Mm -hmm. And the four points of the swastika refer to like the four goals in Dharma. Hmm. And so this idea of Dharma, it, it, it's supposed to, you know, your, your wealth, your life, your family, you know, all these things are, are working together and it, it's the circle of life. And so Dharma is also determined by your caste. And so if you're born in a high caste family, you have a certain Dharma that you follow. If you're born in a low caste family, you have another Dharma that you follow. So again, just for analogy's sake, so people get it, caste is kind of like your social status or social standing, or is it so, more comprehensive? So in, in Hindi, uh, they call it Varna and Jati. Mm -hmm. And so basically it's the idea of class uh -huh. and caste. Uh -huh. So like there are four major classes of people so uh the brahmins the kshatriyas the the sh uh, the bunnies and the, and the shudras and um so basically in these four classes you would have thousands of castes and the indian government actually puts out a book about that thick hmm. of all of the castes in india he went that thick everybody okay yeah. <laughs> sorry so like, like like they so and they're 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 scheduled casts they're forward casts and all of these castes historically kind of represent all of the roles and functions in society and so your caste in a lot of cases will determine who you can marry who you can't marry your profession your job um what life is going to be like for you and that kind of thing so it's a very ordered religion in yeah, one sense it is. um Okay, so um, any, uh, I guess the next question would be anything else on Hinduism that we need in order to understand Jainism? The, 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 the important thing, and um, one of the things when I'm talking to a church or to a group of people about Hindus is you can never assume anything about a Hindu because if there literally are a million Hinduisms, the best way to learn what a Hindu believes is to develop a relationship with a Hindu family and just pepper them with questions to understand where they're coming from so you can communicate more skillfully in, in terms of understanding who they are, what their worldview is, how they think, how they approach life. Um, and in terms of, you know, loving them with your life, uh, with your time and with your witness, it's really important when dealing with Hindus um, to define terms or to, to seek clarification on things they say. So you like, like I, I do. Yeah, that, that's what I would say. And that, um, because there, there are atheist Hindus, there are agnostic Hindus, there are polytheistic Hindus, there are Hindus. So like you take the BAPs, the Swami Narayan Hindus, um, uh, that's one branch. You have the Brahma Kumaris, you have the Hare Krishnas. You've got various sampradayas, so sampradaya is kind of like a denomination. Hmm. You've got various gurus from, you know, you think of guys like Rajneesh or Deepak Chopra, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you've got, uh, it, so it's really hard to nail down. And the Arya Samaj, for instance, like a lot of people, when they think about Hindus, they think about people who worship like a, an idol made of stone. But the Arya Samaj group, they, they reject that and they don't believe in an actual like icon or an idol. And so... 
there's just so much out there that it, it just takes time and questions. And a significant part of India is is Hindu in faith, right? Yeah, about 80, 85 percent for yeah. sure. And then 70 percent of India lives in the village and 30 percent lives in the urban setting. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, and, and you've got, you know, you've got folk folky type hinduism sure. involved with like a lot of black magic and mm-hmm. witchcraft and all that kind of stuff and especially a lot of the, the the village settings and even like you know when you go um it, it, it's all tied together even with you know educated hindus i mean you think about this the the prime minister of india at the time his name was uh, atal bihari vajpayee mm-hmm. he was um i think this would have been back when bill clinton was president this guy was the le- super educated. He was the leader of one of the largest democracies in the world. Now the largest democracy in the world. And this guy worshipped at the feet. It was, was it Sai Baba? And and Atal Bihari Vajpayee talked about having like I, I call them like LSD trips and like visiting the moon and going to different places. Right. So mm. you've got people who are who have had some crazy experiences who claim some extraordinary things um you know you've got people who are a little bit more rational or grounded um you've got people who can't read who are devoted to certain gods or goddesses i mean it's it's a one huge smorgasbord so 80 percent of 1.2 million is about 900 million i mean that's a it's a it's a lot of it's one of the largest religions in the world yeah and in america there are over three million south asian indian people so if you follow those percentages so um eight, let's say 80 percent of three million you could probably guesstimate that's how many hindus are in america mm. um the city i live in in toronto we have uh, we have about five to seven hundred thousand people from india um two to three hundred thousand of them are sikhs we've got so i i mapped out 70 hindu temples in our city mm. in toronto and to put that in perspective the state of new jersey has the most hindu temples out of any state in america in the entire state they have 30 mm. and at least that was several years ago um so the sun never sets on the indian diaspora mm-hmm. you can go to any country in the world and you will find hindu people there you know indians are very enterprising mm-hmm. they're very smart very intelligent they're very hard working they love money they love making money um and so you know whether you're an east african i have friends working with hindus in tanzania in dar es salaam uh, in uh, nairobi in um in mauritius in uh europe all in dallas i mean i there are hindus are everywhere okay well you've already mentioned this principle of uh of non-violence uh which is what is it um the ahinsa. ahinsa. Um, and, and a lot of the concepts we're going to talk about here people are not very familiar with, but if I can just give one kind of bridge so that people can kind of understand, my understanding is is that Mahatma Gandhi was very influenced by Jainism in his, in his whole approach to life and politics, and, and this nonviolent feature was one of the key parts of, of what – uh, was a part of his approach to life. That's that's right. And Gandhi was born in Porbandar, Gujarat, which is kind of um, in the middle of the Saurashtra Peninsula on the Arabian Sea. Mm-hmm. So Gandhi was Gujarati, and Jainism is is like the, in Gujarat. Jainism is is the epicenter. Mm-hmm. So he would have for sure had Jain friends. Um, he would have, I mean, you know, he was a Hindu and he would have understood Mahavira. He would have understood all of these concepts. And so Ahinsa is both shared in Jainism as well as Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, um, yeah, so, yeah, so Gandhi in his Satyagraha movement, you know, like when they did the Dandi Salt March, for instance, Mm -hmm. Gandhi told all of his followers, like, we will not fight, like, we we won't hit. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the British had given us salt tax. And Gandhi's like, you know, this is our country. Um, and they went to one salt farm, I think. And the British knew they were going to be there. And they had batons. And Gandhi told them, look, we're going to go collect salt, but we won't fight back. And so this idea of Ahinsa saw these these Hindu and probably Jain people walking along the beach um, to the salt farm, getting whacked in the head by clubs mm. and not fighting back. And mm. so that the idea of Ahinsa not only applies politically, but it also applies with diet 
and, and clothing and um, and one's vocation in, in India, if you're Jain. So it's, it's an extreme, uh, I'm trying to be descriptive here, it's an extreme asceticism, right, that, that uh, distances itself from attachment to anything earthly. Yeah, so I'll tell you a story. So okay. I was, um, we, we were working in India, and I was doing an audit for my books, and um, my accounting team was comprised of all Jane guys, and so we're working. And uh, when we were finished with the audit, um, the lead accountant, who is a strict Jane, he looks at me, and he says, Clinton, um, he, says, uh, he says, Conrad, okay. um, do you know why there are so many wars in the world? And I had an idea where he was going to go with this, and so I, I, I said, uh, "I said, tell me why? Why are there so many wars in the world?" And he's like, "It's because of all the meat eaters, right?" And so um, I said, well, "Well, tell me about that." He's like, "Well, you know, anyone that takes the life of an animal um, is a violent person, and that violence is is just there, and it makes the world a bad place." And um, and, and so that, like, that's the mindset. In the city that we lived in, the fact was there were very wealthy Jain people that were looking up to buy restaurants that served meat just to close them down. Uh -huh. Right? And so, okay. so you know, you know the, yeah, yeah it, it, was, it was interesting. Huh. So, um, yeah, and so the, the key, I mean, this faith doesn't have a, have a doctrine really other than this this nonviolence and this preservation of life, this desire to be unattached uh, to the world. There are there are vows um, that involve the nonviolence. There are vows that uh, that are tied, I think, to not receiving anything that hasn't been freely given to you. That kind of thing. Yeah, and, and I'm sure there are cultural variations depending yeah. upon like where you come from or or, or, or what sect. Mm -hmm. Or, um, or just even, you know, it's kind of like Hinduism in the sense of, um, you know, even with the, the two distinctions of the two types of genes, like even with those, and so they could have interesting outlooks and interesting ideas on, you know, how they interact with people or what you're saying, like gift, you know, yeah. So that there's an emphasis on truthfulness and integrity. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, now I have one of the vows as being celibacy, which is interesting because it seems to me that that that's a way not to perpetuate your clan, so to speak. So um, Hindus would call that brahmacharya. Uh -huh. And so basically, um, when you take a vow of celibacy, um, so the current prime minister of India mm -hmm. is not, like mm -hmm. he's taken a vow of celibacy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another interesting story. But I, um, yeah, so when, when you decide to do that, it shows that you're a spiritual person and you want to give your life to the causes of God mm -hmm. right? or you know, to w what you believe. And so there are, pe there are, um, if you, if you were to go to Palitana, for instance, this Jane holy place, I've been there several times and, and you can tell those people by what they wear. Hmm. So if you see a woman wearing all white in mm -hmm. a Jane holy place, you know, she's taken that vow. Huh. Right. And, and she's, she's dedicated herself to the purposes of God. Um, and, and so there are cultural markers that you can pick up on uh, with certain people to understand kind of like their level of devotion and, and that kind of thing. Hmm. Uh, another uh, another vow that I see here, well, we've already mentioned this, the non-attachment to worldly possession. I mean, so much so that a, that a strict Jane, my understanding is, moves from place to place and doesn't have a home or anything like that. Is that true? Or, or? There, I, you know, um, I – that – from my own personal uh -huh. experience, um, I, I don't know how much that happens anymore. Uh -huh. um, it used to be. It, it, it would have definitely. Yeah. Uh, so um, they might have referred to it as a sannyasin. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, the different stages of life in like the Hindu worldview where you're, you're a child, then you're a student, um, and then you're kind of like growing into adulthood, and then you renounce things. Um, and you might become a hermit in a forest, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure that happens 
uh, still, but I, I don't think it probably happens as much, especially in the modern world. I see. Yeah, in fact, one of the comments that was made in the, at least the preparation and reading I was doing is is that the modern world has, has injected terrific pressure on pure Jainism. Yeah. Uh, because it's harder, it's becoming harder and harder to live this way. So I'll give you a, a perfect example of that. So um, I have Jane friends who are business guys who do international business, and I know for a fact because they've told me this. Like when they come to New York City, let's say, finding a restaurant that serves pure Jane food, you, you can't find one. Uh huh. And so. Like, I've had Jane friends tell me, okay, well, in that case, we'll go to a vegetarian restaurant and we will eat garlic. Uh We will eat onions because, you you know. And so they will compromise, especially if they're traveling on business. And so, yeah. And and the and the premise of that is is that you, my understanding is is that they want to eat that which has the least sensibility in 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 some sense. That's my paraphrase for it, but there's some sense of orderliness of consciousness that different living beings have, and so they're, they're working down the scale to do the least amount of damage possible in, 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 in the killing. Yeah, yeah, because if you're, if you're, yeah, so they wouldn't eat those things because if they were to dig in the ground, uh-huh. it has the potential to kill things. Right. And so it, it, there's almost like, um, like a, it's, it's taboo. Um, and so it would it, it would really violate many of their cautiousness to do that. Mm-hmm. And so, like I, I'll tell you another story. So I was um, I was when I first moved to India, looking at business opportunities. The reason I chose to work with um, a particular accountant was because I my my German friend who introduced me said um, said to this guy, "You need to meet my accountant." And so he's telling me this story, and he says that. Um, when uh, Johan met, uh, we'll call him Rajiv. Rajiv um, learned that Johan wanted to build a chicken manufacturing uh, processing plant, and so uh, Rajiv says, "Look, Johan, I hope you do really well. I hope you know you make lots of money, but unfortunately, I cannot use my services to set up your company because I feel like it's taking the life of innocent pe- innocent creatures, and you have to find someone else to do that for you." And so when he said that, the fact that he would turn away money for the sake of his convictions, you know, that led me to work with him. Huh. Interesting. So, um, so, uh, I mean, part of, part of what we're dealing with here is this is such a different kind of faith, if I can say it that way. It, it, it really represents a completely different way of thinking about the world, completely different way of thinking about reality, completely different way of thinking about salvation. And yet one of the principles that, we, that we're uh, wrestling with here once we kind of explain what a faith is about is asking the question, so what causes someone to be attracted to this? What, what is the point of adhering to this kind of way of life? It's a great question, and I'll answer it by saying, so when, you know, think about when you were growing up, right, and uh, if you were raised by your parents or a guardian, you probably had your favorite dish maybe that your mom made. So you, you come home from school and you smell your mom cooking this, this delicious food, right, and uh, you have memories of, like, all oh, that, you know, that, that's... And so for a Jain, it's kind of like that, I think, and for a Hindu as well, it, it, it's like you grew up with it, right? You're, mm-hmm. born, you're born into this family. This is the world you know. This is your culture. Yeah. And, and it impacts your relationships. It impacts the people you know, the food that you eat, the rites of passage that you have. It impacts how, how you the, – the filter and the grid in which you learn to see the world around you comes from all of that unspoken stuff that you learn by watching those that you love. And so the, the reason why Jains are Jain and the reason why Hindus are Hindu is because they're born into it, right? Mm-hmm. And, 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 it, and and so, and these, these faiths, these uh, religions, if you want to call them, inform their entire worldview. Uh-huh. And so, um, that, that, yeah, that, that, that's why Jains are Jain. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 uh, let me ask you one other question about content, which I forgot to ask that I should. Um, you've alluded to 
I don't know if it's worship is the right term, but the kind of honor that is given in the con- – and I'm assuming that there are temples and that kind of thing associated with uh, – with uh, Jane's, is that right? They're, uh, they're referred to as Darasars. Uh-huh. Uh, D E R A S A R. So if you Google Darasar, uh-huh. uh, you know, if you are there any Darasars near my location, and it'll tell you, yes, yeah, so there are temples. Um, they will go to temples. Uh, they'll have pujas. Uh, pujas is a, like a, a worship service. Okay. They'll have um, all different kinds of things, they'll have singing. Um, there will be idols in a lot of cases of the tear tonkers and the tear tonkers are these kind of, um, these former people who, um, like Mahavira who, who attain moksha, right? Okay. Um, which is the highest status you can attain, it's the liberation yeah, of the soul. From some sort of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's a kind of honoring of those who have made it. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it, it could be that for sure, and it, it and doing things like that improve your karma. Uh-huh. You know, and so the more you can improve your karma, the better. Okay. You know, and so the better your karma, your next birth, they call it Janam Din. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll yeah, you have a better chance of coming back as something better. Okay. So, um, so this, so the the if I can say it this way, the reward in the religion is by being a cert, a better kind of person, you get a better next life. You could boil down to that. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got this um, we've got this background, we've got this adherence, uh, and I can understand this. You've said that Jains are very, very hard to evangelize, and so, but when you think about how the gospel speaks into a Jain's life. Um, what, what, what do you think of? I, I am really big on pursuing becoming a skillful cross-cultural communicator. Uh huh. You know, people really are different. Um, and in order to communicate in such a way, understanding has to take place first. And so in order to communicate in a skillful way with a Jain, you've got to know what they know. In my, you know, I'm more familiar with Hindus. Right. And so um, the gospel impacts every area of life. It addresses issues of origin, of destiny, of meaning, of significance. Um, you know, it, it, it affirms the fact that men and women are created in God's image. It gives us hope. It gives us something to live for. And, you know, in, in these South Asian cultures, especially Hinduism and Jainism, um, we'll take women, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, being a woman is not an easy thing in, the, in these places. And so um, when, when, when I think when skillful communication is happening and people understand, um, it, it was like Paul in, um, I think it was Acts seventeen twenty. Yeah, we're talking about in Athens. Uh, you remember where where they said to him, Paul, you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And so for me, I think the gospel is would be considered strange things to these ears. Mm-hmm. Right. And and for me, like that's um, that's part of the hope in that it's a different message, and one that I believe is rooted in truth in, in the truth of God. Right. It, it's true, and so taking pains to make sure that I communicate in such a way that these people understand exactly what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. But I've got I've got to know what they know because if I don't know what they know, our communication might miss each other. Yeah, we've talked about in this series throughout what I call getting a spiritual GPS on per, on someone, which basically means listening, 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 yeah. and and initially not worrying about correcting, but just coming to a point of understanding what drives the person spiritually. Yeah. One of my mottos I live by is I prefer clarity over agreement. Uh-huh. Right? And so if, if I can make sure – that I know them and they know me, um, it'll help me in how I transmit the gospel message in the life of Jesus to people who have never heard of him before. Mm -hmm. And of course, the hard part here is, is that, and again, I'll make a comparison to Acts 17, just so we kind of have a point of reference. Um, 
you know, when Paul begins with an audience that doesn't know Genesis from Malachi, they don't know anything about the Bible at all, he starts with the understanding of uh, accountability to a creator God. And they do, in the Greco-Roman world, they do understand transcendent spirits and that kind of thing because there's a lot of religion, religious practice around that involves uh, a lot of religious activity in the broadest sense of that term. Uh, But here you're talking about a whole orientation that doesn't even have that dimension in in a significant way. I mean, there might be the awareness of transcendent power or presence or that kind of thing, but it isn't. It isn't as well. Maybe it, or maybe it is. You said there were three hundred and thirty million gods in in Hinduism, but there's not that personal, direct, singular accountability that that the Christian faith has. So that's a big hurdle. Yeah, and um, reaching people from South Asia is not for the faint of heart, uh-huh. and it, it, you know whether you're from India or whether you're from outside of India, it's a life work. Like it's going to require investment. I mean, we, we've been doing this for 16 years and we're always learning like, and, and, you know, one of my mentors would always say, um, you know, Conrad, uh, there are things you can control and there are things you can't control. Right? You can control how you spend your time with people, what you say to them. You can learn how to communicate. But at the end of the day, it's the work of the Holy Spirit convicting of sin. Sure. You know, and so in, re- in, in, in trying to reach these people, and by the way, um, you know, we need more champions for Hindus and Jains because there aren't many people trying to reach them, mm-hmm. both here and there. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, and, and, and that's why I'm excited to kind of encourage people who might be listening that it, so I, I asked the question today to a group of people i i asked them you know if you decide to invest your life if to give your love your life and your witness to a hindu or Jain family the question was what is the probability that you would be the first one in the entire lineage of their family for the last two thousand years to introduce the gospel hmm. like you would be the first one to do that And if the statistic is true that 95% of 1.2 billion people in India have never heard the gospel, it makes me wonder, like, wow, like you talk about what an opportunity and a privilege from the Creator to to work to try to introduce people to the one who made them. I mean, Mm. yeah. And, of course, one of the challenges in India now in the social and political situation (laughs) is um, it's becoming more restrictive in terms of gaining access for the gospel in the country, uh, and so that's become a problem. But the other flip side of this, as you already mentioned, is with the India di- diaspora, you have people who are Indian who literally are located all around the world. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the current missions paradigm is changing and will be changed within 20 years. Finding, you know, um, I, I'll say this. The current Indian government doesn't like Videshi Dharma, the religion of the foreigner, but they love money. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that, you know, concerned Christians that want to make a difference in South Asia, if they're coming from outside of Asia, they're going to have to start businesses um, to both fund the work of God, but then also to, to reach people in and through the workplace. And, um, I mean, what they say, 90% of people who tithe in the local church in, in North America are in the baby boomer generation or older. And so finding alternative funding streams for there. But even here, it's like, yeah, God has given a prime opportunity to um, reach people from limited access and restricted access countries on our doorstep. Like, I, I asked a lot of people today, how many of you work with a Hindu, know a Hindu, and almost everyone raised, you know, Dallas, every day, five hundred, four to 500 people move to Dallas. A hundred of those are from India. Hmm. It's, it's, it's amazing. So yeah. Dallas, we were actually praying about moving to Dallas to do this and before we went to Toronto, but um, the, the uh, it's Dallas is the fastest growing population of South Asian Indians all of America. Wow. Um, so that means it's it's possible. We just have a couple of minutes left, so let me ask you this. What, what, what advice would you give beyond just getting to know and doing a lot of listening? 
to someone who wants to uh, think about interacting with a with a Jain or or a Hindu for that matter? There, uh, with both Jains and Hindus, there are two barriers you have to overcome. Two barriers. The first barrier is the social barrier, mm-hmm. and the second barrier is the spiritual barrier. Mm-hmm. So most Jains and Hindus aren't going to listen to anything you have to say unless they accept you for who you are. Mm-hmm. So. You've got to go to where they are, and I'm a big believer of not having expectations on lost people and taking the gospel to them. And so, you know, find a local Indian market, and in every Indian market, they're going to have a magazine that advertises and broadcasts where the South Asian community does life, events that are coming up, cricket leagues. And so go get plugged in, go go find where people are and just immerse yourself. Find people who are open to you. And if someone's open to you, you invite them into your world. You know, hey, let's meet with a cup of chai. Let's, let's do this. And you start doing stuff with people. You start building a relationship. So the key is you want to find people who accept you for who you are and then who will respond to the invitation to come into your life. Um, then um, you've got to address the spiritual barrier. You want to introduce Jesus into the equation. So you're listening for needs with your new friend. You know, they say, oh, my mom has cancer. And then you know you say, hey, can I come over and we'll have a prayer ceremony in Jesus' name? And so Jains and Hindus are all about experience. And so you want them to experience the power of prayer and, and to see how you live your life. And, um, and, and you really want to um, invest your life in... I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but just remember the social barrier and the spiritual barrier and just get involved. Just just do something. Well, um, uh, Conrad, I thank you for coming in and, and helping us with Hinduism and Jainism. These are probably largely foreign worlds to our audience, so I thank you for introducing them to us. We thank you for being part of the table. Hope you found the discussion interesting and hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.